Amen. Thank you, Mrs. Green. Boy, that's good. I've, I've encouraged that already. How about you? Did you enjoy that choir song? You want to hear it again? Good. Come back on Easter Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. We're going to sing that Sunday morning. You pray for the choir. They're doing a tremendous job. I am just the temporary choir director, but I'm enjoying it, and they're doing so well. I'm encouraged with it. And uh, we're recording tomorrow night for the Easter broadcast to that song right there. So they've been working hard and working on their parts and memorizing all those things. So I appreciate their hard work. And you pray as tomorrow night, as, or this week, as we record those different elements. Lord, help all those things come together, that the gospel would be powerful as it gets broadcast on TV. We're praying again that we would see souls saved and lives transformed because of the transforming power of Jesus Christ. Not because we have some cool elements that we'll try to put some nifty things in the broadcast. Not because we try to do it pretty sharp, that we're going to try to do it the best of our ability and make it a very good product, right, with as, very, as few errors as possible. I think last year, in the last day, two days, I watched it seven times, right, about seven hours worth of video that I watched over and over to catch things, and many people watched it just as many times as I did. But we're praying not because of those elements or because of the excellence, but because of the power of Jesus Christ. We want it to come through the power of the cross. We're looking forward to that on TV. And we'll have the same service or almost identical service here that morning. So you won't miss anything by coming to church. In fact, it'll be a little bit better at church, I promise you. All right, I, I, I'm so thankful for our online and our live stream and our TV broadcast. We're able to touch many people that we could not touch otherwise and hopefully share the gospel with many people that could not otherwise or wouldn't otherwise hear it, but it's not the same. It's not the same as being right here in church among the, the people of God and the house of God, worshiping God in, in just a congregation. And you're singing those songs, I'll sing of my Redeemer. You're singing those songs that I love, love to hear and Jesus loves even me and hear the choir sing Power of the Cross. It touches you. Different than a TV screen does. I'm thankful for it. Don't get me wrong. I'm thankful for it, but it's different than being right here in church. And I'm encouraged. I'm glad I'm at church tonight. I'm glad you're here as well. It's great to see Brother Steve Evans over there. Many have been praying for Debbie as she's recovering from some, from some procedures. And you keep on praying. And uh, just a gentle reminder for all of us, when someone's sick in those situations, we pray. Um, what is hard, though, at church, when you come to church, everyone wants to know what's happening. And uh, do me a favor, don't ask Steve tonight the update. He'll have to tell it one time to you, but a hundred times to every one of you. And so you just let him know you're praying for him. And uh, every day, uh, there's strength there and getting better and better. So, so you just keep on praying there. Glad to see him there tonight. And so many people every week, we're seeing new faces here at First Baptist Church. New faces, those who are coming back to us uh, from the COVID times and those who are walking in off the street saying, what is this church about? You know what we're about? We're about Jesus Christ. At least that's what we strive to be, and we're going to miss that mark sometimes and hopefully get back on the track. So if you have your Bibles, open to the book of Colossians as we look, chapter number one, just the first two verses, and I've entitled the first chapter of Colossians as an introduction to Jesus. I believe the theme of Colossians is Jesus Christ. Ephesians may be the church of Christ, and Colossians being the person of Jesus Christ, or just quite simply, Jesus Christ. I believe the book of Colossians theme fits right into our theme that God led us to this year of only God. As we look at Colossians, we focus on Jesus Christ. And can you think, can you imagine anyone better than to focus on the end of Jesus Christ himself? The one who came to earth who was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He's not a high priest who cannot be touched with our infirmities. He, he's been where we've been. If we can, he sat where we sat. Bible says that he is relatable to us because he walked on the dirt that we walk on. He saw the sun rise like we see. He had the conflict like we have. And the Bible says in all those ways, now he can better minister to us and pray for us. We have a tremendous Savior, and his name is Jesus Christ. And I want to turn our focus as we talk about Jesus Christ, this book of Colossians is written to the church at Colossae. You would almost think at first that a church wouldn't have to be introduced to Jesus Christ because a good church ought to know about Jesus Christ. But I have found that when you love something or when someone loves something, you can never talk too much about it to that person. In my time in the school, I found out that parents love to talk about their children. Grandparents love to talk about their grandchildren. Pictures, escapades, stories, accomplishments, not usually failures, only the good news. And when someone loves something or someone, they like to talk about it. In fact, 
If you get tired of hearing about Jesus Christ, then you probably don't love him enough. I love to tell the story. Jesus is the sweetest name I know. Oh, how I love Jesus. Tonight as we look at Colossians chapter number one, just a little bit in there, we're going to look at an introduction to Jesus Christ. You know, if I were to ask my wife, Doreen, do you love me? She would probably respond something like this, not, of course I do. That would be the natural response. But it probably the response would go along these lines, why? Now why is that? Why do we have that cynicism in life? Can a fellow just tell his wife, ask her a simple question, do you love me? But we've been honed and trained to say, wait a second, why are you asking if you love me? What have you done or what are you about to do? What have you broken or what are you looking at buying? We would say that's a fairly fair question. My wife were to walk in the door and say, honey, do you love me? My response, though it should be, of course I do, honey, to the ends of the earth. Until time is no more, until death separates us, like I promised to you, my love is endless. That's what my response should be, but I would probably ask a question like, honey, were you able to drive home or did the tow truck bring you home? Tonight, as we look at Jesus Christ... I want us to draw our attention, I want to draw our attention to just a couple aspects, a couple of characteristics that we find just in these first couple of verses, some truths of Jesus Christ. Would you look in Colossians chapter number one, beginning in verse number one, the scripture says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the will of God, to Timotheus our brother, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, I ask these next few minutes, these next few moments, you would turn our hearts again towards your Son, Jesus Christ. Lord, we stand in humility. We stand in adoration of what Jesus did for us on the cross. The death, the burial, the resurrection. But Lord, that was not the end of life, but the beginning of life for us. Lord, now in 2021, as we are bombarded with ideas and philosophies, Lord, we don't need your son less. We need him more now. And Lord, I pray that our hearts would be turned toward him tonight, that our Our thoughts and spirit will be challenged by your word. Your spirit would have freedom in here then that everything that you want to accomplish would be accomplished tonight. Lord, may we leave this place more like your son, Jesus. Lord, help me as I speak to say those things that would be helpful and clear. In Jesus' name I ask. Amen. Just the first two verses of Colossians. Maybe if you've read through your Bible in a year, you've most likely read over these two verses and perhaps even like many would be guilty of read over them very quickly. Obviously, this is a letter that Paul has penned and he's penned it while he has been in prison. He's writing to this church at Colossae that he's never been to before. One of his uh, men that he's worked with, Epaphras, it looks like has gone there and has learned from Paul and then planted this church at Colossae within a 15-mile circle of the church at Laodicea in Herapolis. There's some fellow churches around that area, but Paul's never been here. But in the book of Colossians, like we dealt with last week, he is dealing with some, some false doctrines, some false ideas, some false philosophies. And he brings the attention of this church at Colossae back to the truth. And he brings it back to the truth of Jesus Christ. Jesus in John 14, verse 6, says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. In James chapter 5, James says, His brethren, if any do err from the truth, and what it looks like in those passages is that someone is looking at Jesus Christ and turning away from the truth. Jesus is the truth. And Paul 
begins this letter and he pens this letter in a maybe a familiar way. The book of Ephesians kind of begins a little bit this way. And um, as Paul writes, it's not an abnormal beginning. But there's some tremendous truths in verse 1 and 2 that if we're not careful, we'll miss, that we'll fly right by. That in a sense, we'll just skip because it's just Paul's beginning to his letter. It's almost as if Paul has says, dear church, but he's packed some truth in there. Remember that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable. I believe every single verse in the Bible is profitable for you and for I. And here I see some tremendous truths, if I can. And just two I want to point out. The first one is, I see the calling of Paul. I see in this first verse where the Bible says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. Paul is introducing himself, saying, listen, this is me who's writing to you. This is not somebody else. This is not Apollos. This is not some false teacher. This is Paul. And in case you wonder who I am, I'm an apostle. And I'm not just an apostle for my own good. I'm not just seeking my own agenda. I'm not not just on my own path. I'm an apostle of Jesus Christ. Don't forget, my friend, your identity that is found in Jesus Christ. We are not here just to be a howl, just to be a pastor of a church, just to be a wife or a husband or a child or a member, we are here as a child of God and a servant of Jesus Christ. Now Paul here explains a little bit in this, in this title, it gives us some idea about what God has called him to. He says he's an apostle by Jesus Christ, by the will of God, and Timotheus, our brother. He never refers to, to, to Timothy, to, to, to Timotheus, as an apostle. You see, an apostle in the Bible had to have three different qualifications. One, an apostle had to be an eyewitness, an eyewitness to Jesus after the resurrection. Now, Paul was not there, that, far we know, after the, the tomb. But we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 where Paul says this, am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not seen Jesus Christ our Lord? See, Paul was not called by accident. Paul was called on purpose. And you and I are called on purpose. Don't miss this tonight, uh, Christian, that God has a calling for you. And Paul's calling was to be an apostle of Jesus Christ, not just by his own will, he says, but by the will of God. Planned, if we can, before the foundation of the world, God had a plan and said, listen, this particular person named Saul that will be transformed into Paul when he's saved is going to have, I'm going to have a plan for him. David says this, or the psalmist says this, that in my mother's womb I was formed perfectly. I was shaped perfectly. God has a calling for you and for me, and he made you the way that he wants you to be so you can fulfill not your successes, not your agenda, not your design, but his calling. You see, sometimes we don't like our calling. We want someone else's calling. I want their calling because they've got a nice house. Well, la -di da I want their calling because, boy, they got a cushy job. Who cares? I want their calling because, boy, have you heard them sing? Man, beautiful. Have you heard them teach? Have you heard them communicate? Boy, have you watched them work with, maybe with wood or with paint or with, have you watched them work on a car? I want their calling because if I had their calling, then I would be useful. Then I would do what they do. And God did not make me like you or you like me, and you ought to be thankful for that. God made each one of us separately, independently, uniquely, and special. But you see, the good shepherd, the Bible says, he leads us. He does not drive us. There's a difference. Sometimes I drive my children. Crazy, actually. Drive them to school in the morning. They're along for the ride. Where are we going, Dad? Wherever I want to take you. Other times, I lead them. 
hey kids, here's what I want you to do. God leads us. He leads us beside still waters. The, the, the great shepherd, the good shepherd leads us. There is a marked difference. And, but, but, but listen, don't miss the calling of God and, and don't, don't miss what he has for you. Paul's not complaining. Paul's not complaining. In the book of 2 Corinthians, Paul will go through all the different tribulations that he had to go through that God brought him through. Shipwrecked and beatings, stonings, being chased by people who wanted to murder him. Now on trial, now in bondage. Now in bondage. That's the calling that Paul had. That's not normally what we want. We want the cool parts of Paul's calling. I want to be able to raise someone to life again. I want to be able to heal somebody. Boy, I want to be able to write that letter that the church just listens to and changes. That's what happened at the, in the book of Corinthians. Paul wrote the letter, and this, by the time the second letter goes, boy, they're on the right track. They're, they're learning in some things. But Paul didn't know all that God would take him through. He just had to follow the plan that God had for him. Now, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, when Paul was born, I doubt that he thought, one day I'm going to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. In fact, I believe it was exactly the opposite because Paul, formerly known as Saul, was on a mission to destroy the religion of Christianity, or so he thought. Throwing people in jail, standing by holding the coats while Stephen, the first martyr, was, was stoned to death. His mission, his own personal agenda was exactly opposite of what God had for him. But God miraculously saved him and changed him and gave him a brand new calling and a brand new mission. And now Paul, as he writes to the church at Colossae, says, this is Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I wonder, and I don't believe so, but I wonder if Paul almost every day was reminded about the, the sanctity and the blessing of serving Jesus Christ. Once formerly an enemy, now a friend. Once believed to be a false deity, but now the true deity. I wonder if maybe there's a tear that came down his eyes as he penned those words. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. I wonder if he sat there for a moment and just kind of let that sink in again. I wonder if he sat there in the chains and house arrest in prison and said, Thank you, Lord. Thanks for calling me. Thanks for letting me be an apostle for you. Imagine if you could have sat by Paul that day. I doubt that he would say, Boy, I don't think it's worth it. Do you? I think he'd say, boy, if I hadn't done this path, I wouldn't be in bondage. I wouldn't be in prison. I'd be out running around. You think he'd say, I wish I had that path. I don't think so. I think he'd say, I would do everything all over again, except I'd do it sooner. I wouldn't waste time running around chasing Christians. I'd run around chasing Jesus Christ. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. We have a call and we must embrace the call that God has for us. Sometimes we tire of our roles and responsibilities. Maybe you feel, I'm just called to be just a little mom at home. Then be the little mom at home the best you can be. What a tremendous and a great calling of Jesus Christ. Well, I'm just, I'm just a, a dad and I'm just working on the line. Then be the best guy on the line you can be. Don't underestimate what God wants to do with your life. It's a tremendous calling of Jesus Christ. In our vision, we put different levels. Wow, Paul, an apostle, he's way over here, but I'm just pumping gas over here. No, we're serving him. And on this field, we're all like this. He's up here, and we're like this. We tire of our roles and responsibilities, but you see, we get our calling wrong when we imagine that God needs us to be the heroes of our story. God doesn't need you. God doesn't need me to be the hero of our story. He is the hero of our story. His name is Jesus Christ. He is the story, the beginning and the end. The Bible says he's the author. He's the finisher of our faith. So quit writing your own story. Let him write the story. Get up in the morning and say, Lord, I'm called to serve you today. Lord, what are you going to write in this page today? I'm likely to go to work. Lord, it's got to be bigger than just work. What do you have for me today? Don't try to be the hero of your story. Let him write the story. God can take our failures, even our greatest failures, 
and turn them into the greatest successes. Saul was the most unlikely candidate to be an apostle of Jesus Christ. If you had lined up the people to, to be an apostle, you would not have chosen Paul. You said, boy, this guy, he was a disciple for a long time of Jesus. I want him to be an apostle. This guy who's chasing Christians? Nope, you go over there. Um, all right, you love Jesus. You hate Jesus. You go over there. You would not have chosen Paul to be an apostle. But God said, I chose him. And Paul said, God chose me. I'm an apostle by the will of God. I read a story about a man. His name was Charles Colson. He ended up working for President Richard Nixon back in 1969. At 38 or 39 years old, he had already accomplished so much in life. He had served in the office of the assistant to the secretary of the Navy. He had ran a political campaign, joined a law firm, and now he became, at 38, the special counsel to President Richard Nixon. But it all came crashing down when he was implicated in the Watergate scandal. Went to prison. Career ruined. Reputation marred. Ideas and dreams crushed. Now a convict. But while he was in prison, the story goes, he accepted Jesus Christ. He was introduced to Jesus Christ. He got a calling from Jesus Christ. He began to work with the prisoners. Because of his passion for faith and for his fellow man, he started a little ministry that we now know as the Prison Fellowship. When he got out of prison, he continued he continued this ministry, and now Prison Fellowship, I'm told, serves in all 50 states, impacting over 365,000 men and women every single year. Charles said this, the real legacy of my life was from my biggest failure. My failure, he said, became his success. We all have a calling. The next time you read the beginning of a book in the New Testament, you read about Paul or James. I want you to pause a moment and thank the God of the universe that he'd call you and to me to something. That he'd say, listen, I've got something special for you today. All right, not just tomorrow, not just next week, but today and tonight, something for you. But not only do I see the calling in this passage, I also see the comfort in verse number two. He writes there and he says, listen, to the saints and the faithful brethren in Christ, which are at Colossae, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Boy, I love not only verse number one, but I love verse number two. Paul begins and he says, listen, I'm talking to those who are faithful and to the saints, to the chosen, to the anointed ones, to the saved ones who are at Colossae. There's this little church here. We don't know how big it was. Maybe a little church could have had 5,000 people. We don't know. But he says, listen, you're faithful. You're saints. All right, you've been called by God. You're in Christ. And I want to wish you and grant you two things. I want you to have some grace in your life. It's more than just a standard greeting. Around church, we have some standard greetings. Hi, good to see you today. Whether we mean it or not, we say it. And sometimes we ask the nebulous question, how are you? Now, do you really want to know how someone is? Oh, yes. Yes, I do, Pastor. I'm dying to know how everyone's doing for the first five minutes. As they go on to the second five minutes or the second ten minutes, the second half hour, then you think, maybe I don't care exactly how you're doing. Maybe I won't say that next time. Maybe I'll just say, hi, and leave it right there, not even good to see you. Paul's greeting here was not just a, hey, hope you have some grace and peace. There is something much more significant going on here. We're introduced to Jesus Christ in this passage. Notice that when Paul, first of all, points us to the grace of Jesus Christ. He wants us to have grace and peace that come from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Grace, 
favor or benevolence. God's grace goes beyond some casual favor or some casual niceness and kindness. God's grace seeks to load the object that is the saint of Colossae, and consequently you and I, God's grace seeks to load us with his favor and his benefits. If I can, Paul is saying, I want God to dump out his favor. I want God to dump out his benefits all over you according to his riches, not just according to to someone else, but the grace that comes from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Listen, this is the very best thing that we can have when God puts his grace on our life. It is not just kindness from a fellow from a fellow human being. And there's some, been some very nice things that people have done, some very benevolent things. People have purchased houses for people. People have pardoned people. But when God, when Jesus Christ dumps out his grace onto you and to me, it is overwhelming. He says, I want the grace of God, the grace of God, supernatural, undeserved merit and goodness found in Jesus Christ. John says this, for the law was given by Moses, but grace and truth, grace and truth came by Jesus Christ. We had the law before, but now Jesus is here, introduce you to Jesus, and Jesus shows up with some presence. Jesus shows up with grace. That means I'm going to smile on my face because Jesus is there. When a person works an eight-hour day and receives a fair day's pay, that's a wage. When a person competes in a sporting event, event against an opponent and receives a trophy for his performance, that is a prize. When a person receives appropriate recognition for long service or high accomplishments and achievements, that is an award. But when a person is not capable of earning a wage, can win no prize, and deserves no reward, yet receives a gift anyway, that, my friend, is grace. And you and I are blessed with the grace of Jesus Christ. Imagine... Imagine that you are half a million dollars in debt, $500,000. For most of us, it's a large sum of money. Imagine that you have a half a million dollar debt and that I happen to come and write you a check that is good for half a million dollars. Give it to you, cash, and pay off your debt. I imagine that you'd say thank you to me, would you not? I would hope you would. I would probably even half expect you to say thank you. If I gave you half a million dollars, $500,000. But suppose that you come to me and say, well, I would say thank you, but really, I did you a favor of taking that money off your hands. It probably was just burning a hole in your pocket. You didn't know what to do with it anyway, and I'm glad that I could help you at, so make sure you thank me for helping me out of my life. Yet sometimes we come to Jesus Christ who owes us nothing, has given us everything, and we act like we've done him a nice thing following him, when in fact he's done the nice thing allowing us to have his grace in our life. When Paul says, listen, you can have this grace, we have to understand it's undeserved, but this grace is desired, came across this amazing verse in the book of Luke, talking about Jesus Christ, and the child grew and waxed strong in spirit, filled with wisdom, and the grace of God was upon him. The Bible says in the book of Luke that the grace of God was upon Jesus Christ. What struck me as I thought about that verse is this prayer request. I want the grace that God showed to Jesus on my life. I want that same grace that he showed to his son. My Bible says, but as many as believe him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. I want the same grace that Jesus, from God, had in his life, I want it on my life. 
I, I don't want the grace for someone else. I want what he put on Jesus. I want that on my life, on this church, on your life. I want that kind of power because you know that Jesus had the full grace of God in his life. God didn't hold back on his only begotten son, did he now? And he won't hold back on you and me. And Paul says, listen, fellow, uh, fellow faithful servants and saints at Colossae, I'm praying that I want the grace of God, from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, I want it to be upon you. I want it to be to you. Grace is desired. You see, we can only take the grace of God for one day. Tomorrow is new grace, new strength, new help. In a sense, it's like the man in the wilderness. We get what we need for right now. And tomorrow, we get to go back for more. Not only do I see the gift of grace here, but I see the gift of peace. Where he says, grace be unto you and peace from God our Father. Not an absence of conflict, but a supernatural calmness and courage and hope found in Jesus Christ. The book of John says it this way. Jesus says, these things have I spoken unto you that in me, that is in me in Jesus, ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. Because I have overcome the world. And not only is the supernatural grace that Paul wishes upon these saints and I wish upon us, but supernatural peace, peace that brought reconciliation with God, the fruit of the Spirit. It brings the result of the power. We're no longer at war with God, but now we're filled with the power of God. Peace is not the absence of conflict, but the presence of the Savior. You can travel through life. You can wake up tomorrow, Monday morning, to go to work with a peace, a supernatural peace. Why? Because of Jesus Christ. Why can life be good tomorrow? Because of Jesus Christ. You see, in these first two verses, I see a calling and I see comfort that hits me every single day. And every day I can get up and say, Lord, I want to fulfill your plan. And Lord, thank you for what you've given to me today. Grace and peace. Safety consists not in the absence of danger, but in the presence of God. It's a story told of of a submarine in the Navy. And Brother Philhart served on a submarine in the Navy. I wonder if he could attest to this. That one time when it was being tested, had to remain submerged for many hours. When it returned to harbor, the captain was asked, how did the storm last night affect you and affect the submarine? And the captain responded, what storm? We didn't even know there was one. Apparently in a submarine can travel beneath the depths of the ocean that no matter how high the waves are up here, they can come to a place that's called the cushion of the sea. And inside the cushion of the sea, everything up here can be going on, but it doesn't touch anything down here. And I don't want the cushion of the sea in my life. I want the comfort of the Savior. So when all this is going on up here, and sometimes it happens, Sometimes it's crashing all around us. Sometimes it's huge, insurmountable, unbelievable, unimaginable. But with Jesus Christ, introduced to Jesus Christ, there's the comfort of the Savior. That's where someone says, well, how can you go through that? How can you be so calm? Are you just numb? No, I'm not numb. I'm comforted. I, I can see it. I can feel it. But there's something greater going on here. And it's this peace. And not just a little self-help peace where I count to ten or sit doing yoga in my back corner of my house. Not just this, this thing I take or thing I think about, but this peace that comes from Jesus Christ. See, the book of Colossians introduces us to Jesus Christ. And in these first two verses, we find out that we have a calling Jesus Christ and we have a comfort in Jesus Christ. My friend, I hope that you know Jesus Christ. I hope you know his calling in your life. I hope you know his grace and his peace in your, in your life. I hope you're not trying to artificially manufacture favor. Sometimes Christians will do that. 
Well, God will love me because I'm in church. I'm carrying my big Bible. I'm reading this word. And we ought to be in church. We ought to carry a Bible. And you can carry a big one. It's fine with me. That doesn't manufacture grace. Sometimes we want to manufacture peace and jump out of situations. We don't want to do that. We want the peace and the grace that comes from knowing and resting and abiding in Jesus Christ. Paul, in these first two verses, sits us down theologically. He sits us down and says, listen, don't forget your calling. and Don't forget what you've got while you're here. Lord, I thank you for your word. Thank you for these truths, Lord, just from these first couple of verses. Lord, I pray that you'd help us tonight. Maybe there's someone here who has doubted the calling that you've put on their life and placed on their life. Maybe discontent. But maybe there's someone here who needs to be reminded about your grace and your peace in their life. Oh, that supernatural, unbelievable favor, comfort, and merit. Christian, simple message tonight, just about Jesus Christ. Wonder if God touched your heart tonight. Wonder if you'd say, well, Pastor, yeah, I need to rest right there. I need to go no further than verse 1 or verse 2 in the book of Colossians. I need to come back to Jesus. Boy, there's nothing to be ashamed of in that. Nothing to be <clears throat> sad about that. We come back to him. And he receives us with open arms. How's the peace in your life? How's the calling doing in your life? Let me introduce you to Jesus Christ. Lord, bless this invitation. May we respond like we ought to. May you do a work in our hearts and lives, in Jesus' name, amen.